Hi everyone, I'm going to be talking about <clears throat> mechanisms of gram-negative resistance today as far as our... Oops, that not working. Um, as far as the learning objectives, we're going to talk about uh, the three most common um, resistance mechanisms and kind of patterns that go along with that. And then I also did throw in difficult to treat pseudomonas as kind of a fourth topic. Typically, you go over ESPL, AMPC, um, and carbon penem resistance. And then there's a few uh, patient cases or just kind of discussions of some MICs and organisms throughout that um, the fellows can talk through and we can all talk through to see what uh, we would do. Um, so to start out with, there's three generalized mechanisms of resistance. There's minimization, modification, and activation. Uh, minimization is going to be your porons and efflux pumps, so it's going to be minimizing the amount of uh, antibiotic that's within the, gram that's in the, the cell wall or within the actual organism. Uh, modification is going to be mainly uh, mutations in target site. You kind of see these with aminoglycosides a whole lot of the time. Um, you can add on either an amino acid or methylation and slightly change, changes the binding area. Um, and then the activation is going to be your beta lactamases. So that's going to be your ESBLs, um, your KPCs, anything that produces an enzyme um, that causes uh, inactivation of your beta lactam or drug being used. So discuss uh, minimization a little bit further. Um, so efflux pumps, I think we're all a little bit familiar with these. So it really is about the R&D pump family um, is the most well described. It confers multi-drug resistance. So you'll see uh, with this pump, you'll see resistance with, tiger, or with your tetracyclines, um, with your aminoglycosides. And the main thing that can kind of happen to a bacteria when it does develop the super family of a pump, um, it is it can uh, be metabolically costly. So you will see some resistance go in and out uh, with different susceptibilities when you're treating a patient. Um, our membrane porons, so this is by the means of restricting access to the cell membrane and gram-negative um, organisms. There's going to be three losses for this, whether you have a loss of the poron, a mutation in the poron, or just decreased expression. So all those are going to result in less drug getting within the actual cell. Um, this is going to be typically in a patient that has previously been treated. So if you have somebody that has maybe a um, an osteo that uh, comes back uh, comes back, or you have a patient with a um, you know hip arthroplasty and it comes and they have to and they have continual infections, um, you know heavy introduction of continual antibiotics is going to be most likely the mechanism for this. Um, three of the more common ones that we'll get into a little bit. Um, the one you're probably most familiar with or would be familiar with is going to be operon D in Pseudomonas. Um, this is going to be how you confer resistance to carbapenems. And then as far as your KPCs, um, Klebsiella pneumoniae, um, K36, is going to be your resistance for your cephalosporins, um, carbapenems, and your fluoroquinolones. Um, so for an activation, it's going to be the enzymatic hydrolysis that I mentioned earlier. Um, these are split up into two kind of different groups, um, serine beta-lactamases, which is your ambler class A, C, and D and then uh, zinc uh, metalloproteinases, which is class B. So to break all these down, um, as you can see within the top row, it's going to be your enzyme. Um, bottom row is going to be the activity that it mainly targets against, and then your ambler class is what it's going to be falling into. So for ambler class A, it's going to be your extended beta-lactamases and your KPCs. Those are, your, again, your serine-based um, activity residues. Um, these are going to be plasmid borne, and then you can see below potentially the beta lactam activated by it. Um, as far as class B, that's going to be your uh, metato beta lactamases. Um, it's going to be, again, your uh, zinc active residue. Um, it's plasmid bound as well. And then it breaks down into class C, which is your AMP C, and class D, which is your OXA48 group. Um, so first, we're going to talk about um, ESBLs. Um, we're going to talk about Tim, Shiv, and then the most common one that we probably are more than more common one that we're used to seeing is CTXM or familiar with using carbapenem. Um, so penicillinases, so ESBL falls into class A group two. Um, so broad spectrum is going to be Tim1, Tim2, and Shiv1. So they're going to hydrolyze penicillins and narrow spectrum cephalosporins. So a lot of the times when you see um, an infection with H. influenzae, you see it's beta-lactamase positive or beta-lactamase negative from the micro group. This is indicating that it most likely has one of these penicillinases. So instead of being able to use something like ampicillin, you kind of have to use augment. You need that clavulonic acid or you need unison. You need something to help bind it. It's not a super large uh, resistance, but it does inhibit your early generation um, penicillins and cephalosporins. Um, the one we're more worried about is your cephalosporinases. So this is your extended spectrum. Um, examples are TIM10, TIM26, um, and CTX15. Um, um, 
So this is going to do hydrolyze everything above, plus your third gen cephalosporins and s um, One thing to note is that uh, cefoxetin is definitely going to retain susceptibility despite these enzymes if ESPL is the only mechanism of resistance that it has. Um, a lot of these had spread through horizontal train transfer. And the biggest group that you're going to see these in is going to be your E. coli, um, your Klebsiella pneumoniae, uh, Klebsiella oxytosa, and Pro uh, Proteus mirabilis. And if your micro lab does not actually report out the ESBL or the distinct um, mechanism of resistance, um, CLSI defines it as a ceftriaxone MIC um, greater than or equal to four. So what we know as far as clinical data wise, I think we're all familiar with the Mirena one trial. This was looking at Zosin versus Mirapinum. Um, when you kind of get down to the 30 day mortality, um, there was a significant uh, risk involved when using uh, Piperacil and Tazobactam. But one thing that kind of has happened ever since that trial is a lot of people have wanted to break down the resistance genes within that trial just because of the various countries that it was done in. So when you actually break everything down, we have about um, the majority of the group having CTXM um, and then also some near spectrum OXA, um, SHIP, ESBL, and then AMPC included. So when you take the data and you break it down by MIC and or you, they did a post analysis by looking at MIC and 30 day mortality. So really looking at the resistance genes and the MICs of variations to Zosin. Um, you can see that E. coli was sequenced the most um, with the sequence type and actually co harbored a bunch of OXA 45s. Um, and then so when Islet had both OXA and ESBL, you had a significantly higher uh, Zosin MIC. Then um, comparatively, it was eight versus two, which is pretty large, competing, uh, especially considering the dose that they were using. We know that they weren't dose optimizing Zosin within this trial. So getting down to redoing the 30 day mortality. Um, so when you look at the Zosin non susceptible breakpoint, so anything greater than 16, um, the mortality difference was 9%, which is significantly higher. And then if you look at it from a micro um, accessible population, the mortality difference increased up to 8%. So when you decided to exclude those groups with the MIC greater than 16, your actual 30 day mortality difference was reduced to 5%, which is pretty massive considering the results that you saw on the previous page of you know, minus, minus 12 versus three or an 8% difference. And so they were able to conclude that if you had an ESBL and OXA1 gene, it was associated with higher level MICs for Zosin, thus a higher incidence of uh, 30 day mortality. So where does this take us? Um, so recently CLSI, I shouldn't say recently, back in February, they just kind of did this without telling a lot of people. They added in an actual um, dose dependent category for Zosin. Um, so this is going to be, if you're using Zosin at its um, you know, maximized PKPD probabilities, so it's gonna be that four and a half gram administered every six hours is a three hour infusion, or four and a half grams every eight hours is a four hour infusion to really capture those higher level MICs. So some of the take home points, um, if you have an ESBL bacteremia, I'm still going to recommend you use a carbapenem based upon the data. But if you have something like a low inoculum infection, maybe a pylo or, you know, a cystitis, or you have, you know, you talk to your surgery teams and there's an abscess that's been completely drained and you've seen resolution on CT, um, or you have, and you also have lower MICs, you might can potentially get away with using Zosin. Um, I know that you probably will have, you know, different opinions based upon different people you ask. Um, in general, um, but there's still, especially if you're already on Zosin and your patient's, you know, completely stable and this has been about, I think it's completely okay to continue on with Zosin at this point. So to transition to the AMPC beta lactamases, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the plasmid based ones, but mostly focus on the chromosomal. Um, so there's three categories of resistance. Um, there's the inducible chromosomal that we're all familiar with. This is going to be in your interbacter clachy, your citrobacter, um, the typical, you know, acronym that we're able to, that we all realize. And then there's also going to be some non-inducible uh, chromosomal resistance or stable derepression due to mutations in AMPC. Um, this is going to be actually E. coli, uh, Shigella, and Acinetobacter. And then there are some plasmid-mediated AMPCs. These aren't extremely common, but you will run across these. Um, Klebsiella and E. coli uh, will actually gain um, an AMPC gain of function by being close around to something else that's AMPC derepressed. Uh, but the main focus, and that I think we're all more familiar with, is going to be this inducible chromosome resistance. 
So this is an article by uh, Timmy and colleagues in CID in 2019 um, that goes through the whole process of actually how inducible chromosomal resistance happens. So you have three regulatory genes. You have AMP-G, which is involved in peptidoglycan recycling, um, AMP-D, which is responsible, you can see down here, for uh, cleaving these cell wall products um, to be able to bind to AMPR, uh, to, to reduce their ability to bind to AMPR and actually get uh, back to cell wall synthesis. And then you have uh, UPD, which is a byproduct of cleavage, which enables um, AMPR regulation, as you can see down here, it's a negative impact upon it. So when you normally have a wild type organism that is does have a chromosomal AMPC, um, AMPR reduces AMPC beta lactamase expression at very low levels. So we call this as repressed. So once you have a beta lactam induced or introduced, um, this is when you start to see some of that negative feedback mechanism turn into a positive feedback mechanism and you have the derepression. So beta lactams introduce, you know, the byproduct of breaking down the cell wall. They bind that poron channel and that um, PVPs on the out and within the inside. They um, cause breakdown of these byproducts. And so AMG is going to be unable to cleave all the necessary peptides because the continual displacement that occurs. So you're going to have increased cell wall degradation and, and decreased UPD. So this is going to cause that buildup within the actual cell. You're going to have com competition with uh, binding towards AMP-R. Um, so with the binding of these cell degradation products to AMP-R, AMP-R is not going to be to, um, de or to repress AMP-C. Thus, AMP-R goes under conformational change, resulting in increased AMP-C production to help bind up some of these byproducts. The result of this is a subsequent AMP-D mutation. So after um, beta lactam exposure ceases, you still have AMP-C production levels uh, generally turn a baseline, but once you have that mutation, you're going to have a stable derepression. So this is where you're going to have, uh, you know, that consistent resistance to ceftriaxone at this point in time. So you'll have the over transcription of AMP-C, even in the absence of a beta-lactam trigger. Um, so the bugs of concern, that most concern for this, I think we're probably all most familiar in the beginning with these acronyms, uh, MySpace, SPACE, SPICE, um, that falls in line with these potential organisms. What actually happened is more recently, um, there's been a transition to the heck yes bugs. Um, this is Hafnia, um, Enterobacter uh, clegate complex, um, Cytobacter fundii, um, Klebsiella erogenes, previously known as Enterobacter erogenes, and then Yersinia. But how did they actually come about knowing these organisms? So there's a study done in Jack in, in about 2018 that looked at the mutation rates for derepression within the specific groups of the SPACE acronym. What really happened is they were able to show that the amp -CD repression uh, rates in the mutants uh, recorded at a mean rate of three times 10 to the negative eighth for these specific organisms. So for the interbacteroclechi complex, um, orogenes, fundi complex, and hafnia. And then when you look at serratia, uh, previdentia, and morganella, there was just a significantly less chance of a mutation rate. So, so for serratia, is 15 lower fold um, for Revidentia, it was 50 to 150. And then even for Morganella, it was 600 fold lower. So what does exactly mean? This is how they came up with that acronym. Um, the reason Yersinia kind of gets thrown in there is they wasn't in within this study and they weren't exactly quite sure of its mutational rates. It does have a pretty high mutational rate if you look within the literature. So it was just added into the group as that part of that end of that acronym. Um, as far as clinical data, um, I chose not to include the Moreno 2 trial in here. It was just really, really small. Um, it looked at um, Zosin versus Mirapinum, and it didn't really give any kind of like generalized outcomes. They really need to expand upon that trial. Um, once that trial gets larger, it'll be something to look at. But what we do kind of know is that s several observational studies suggest that cefepine leads to similar clinical outcomes. Um, however, if you do have elevated MICs um, of four to eight, it might have the potential likelihood of having ESBLs. So there's one particular study that um, of the interbacter clicky complex isolates is about, I think about 50 to about 65 of them. 89% of them that had the higher MICs were also ESBL producing. Um, as far as looking at Zosin, um, there's mixed data usage, referring back to the Moreno 2 trial. So there's some comfortability with using it um, for AMPCs, but generally stay away from it. Um, so for take home points, um, cefepime still I would recommend for moderate to high risk AMPC production. 
Um, so going back to that acronym of heck yes, uh, when your MIC is less than or equal to two, if you start to have a higher MIC and it might be a higher inoculum infection, such as a endocarditis, um, an abscess that's undrainable, um, something in osseo that can't be, you know, getting towards or anything like that. That's when consideration for a carbapenem because you're going to need those extended, you know, long time of therapy. Um, as far as uh, ceftriaxone and zosin, I would, you know, feel comfortable with, you know, low risk AMPC organisms and low inoculum infections. So again, going back to that, you know, completely source controlled or going back to that, you know, cystitis, pyelonephritis type picture. Um, and then something else to be wary of is be wary and cautious of plasma-mediated AMPC production and Klebsiella and E. coli. And the best thing you can do is to observe the cefoxitin MIC. Um, traditionally in these organisms, and we know with the EPLs, as we mentioned previously, uh, cefoxitin remains stable. Um, if you do start to see cefoxitin resistance, it can hint at potentially an AMPC type picture or something in class C um, resistance mediated, which we'll get a little bit into. Um, so this was a um, consult I had with Dr. Hanley. Um, so we, I didn't include all the vitals, just briefly to give the information out to you all. So we had an intra-abdominal abscess, um, complicated intra-abdominal infection. They had to go on, undergone an X-lap, uh, washout, a hemicolectomy, <clears throat> and in leostomy on 6-6. So we noticed, uh, the uh, pre-op no noticed there was a bunch of frank stool throughout extensive washout. <clears throat> so everything was done per guide OC on 6-7. They had contained complete source control. The antibiotics that were started were zosin and mycofungin, and these were what the cultures resulted from the ORJP drain. Um, so we have an E. coli, um, pen sensitive, and then we have a Klebsiella pneumoniae um, with some kind of not traditional MICs that will throw you off a little bit. In particular, we have the zosin MIC of 16, and we have the cefoxin MIC of 32, which is resistance. Um, everything else is kind of falls in line um, with what needed to be. Given the information that we were told there was complete source control, we are confined continuing existence at this point in time. But about 48 to 72 hours later, um, there was initial improvement, but then subsequently, uh, the leucocytosis happened up to 54. Um, on an abdominal exam, uh, they were very distended. They had a new fever of 102. Um, we had got a repeat CT at this time, um, it, which showed multiple rim enhancing collections around the liver and lower pelvis. Um, additionally, the patient ended up being intubated, sedated. Um, there was reports of foul smelling brown discharge from the incision site. And then on 6-9, the abscess drain placed by um, IR showed these cultures. Um, as you can see, this is the same E. coli that was pan-sensitive previously beforehand. Um, this is an organism that's hidden with the blue box, but this is our Klebs Klebsiella pneumoniae. Um, we can see that it is now um, fully uh, resistant to zosin. Um, ceftriaxone is resistant, um, cefoxitin is resistant, um, cefepime MIC is less than or equal to one, um, and then AMP and, of course, Unison are both resistant with that. So what do y'all think, mechanistically wise, what happened? When I unreveal this box down below, what do you think is going to be likely? Yeah. So what actually happened is there was also a, cle a Klebsiella erogenes in there that was already AMP CD repressed, whether it, whether she had this collection before and we didn't know it and it and it just didn't get picked up with the initial um, aspiration of drainage um, showed about but it does kind of make you you know ponder wonder up front when and dr haley and i had this discussion initially saw this right here should we have preemptively just changed to cefepime um given that we were told it was complete source controlled we you know we were fine with continuing it but, you know, hindsight 2020, kind of seeing this and kind of noticing that maybe should have hinted us at potentially just changing early on with what was going on. But at this point in time, we changed them over to um, cefepime and flagell, and they ended up responding really well to that. But it does make you still, you know, point out that, you know, not every single mechanism when you see, I mean, most commonly E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae are going to be ESBLs, but really kind of, you know, monitoring your other antibiotics or that you're able to see. Um, I know at Moffitt with our intra-abdominal stuff, not so much our blood cultures were able to see the cefoxin in MIC. I don't know about other institutions, um, what they're able to show. Um, we went with two grams Q8. Uh, given just the multiple um, abscesses, it was a younger patient too. We kind of went with the full dosing um, on the cefepime at this point. We either did two grams Q8 or one gram Q6. Um, just the potentially max PKPD wise that was going on. 
Um, some people I know in this case would have maybe felt, you know, seeing this um, ceftriaxone MIC would have maybe potentially been uncomfortable using a carbapenem, but kind of knowing, you know, your resistance mechanisms, what was going on, and then seeing this down here um, really gave us the comfortability to um, go with um, cefepine. So kind of looking at what your wild type you know, or, um, antibiotics would look like, and then looking at what a hyper, uh, hyperproduction AMC would look like. Um, as you can see previously, um, you will have some potential um, sensitive or resistant zosins um, that come about, or piperacillin and tazobactam. Um, your cefepime can be, um, as, as we'll see, as we'll see, can be sensitive or sensitive dose dependent. Um, and then your astrinam is going to be either sensitive or resistant, most likely resistant. Um, but just to give you an idea of what your potential uh, resistant patterns will look like, um, and the biggest one is going to be the cefoxetin. Um, in an ESBL setting, this should still say sensitive. Now transitioning to our carbapenem resistant in our bacterials. Um, I did change, you'll notice it later on. I just want to give you the heads up. Um, instead of using CRE, I use CPO and CRO. So our carbapenem uh, producing organism and carbapenem resistant organism, just to help you all uh, delineate the differences between the two. But the two main enzymes that we're going to focus on is KPC and OXA48. Um, I, that's kind of what has been at least the majority of the enzymes, at least here at Moffitt and and the surrounding areas that I've heard of. Um, there are some other ones that we'll discuss about that you see rarely, but not super often. There's three generalized mechanisms for resistance. The first two is going to be your up ag related um, AMPC with either an efflux or poron alteration. Um, and then your next um, mechanism is going to be your carbapenemases. So this is going to be your KPC, your OXA48, um, NDM with VIM. Uh, imps and then SMEs. So this is going to all be uh, beta lactamase enzymes that break down all beta lactams. We'll have a little bit of an exception on the next slide. Um, it's going to be plasma mediated and it's going to take out multiple um, antimicrobial agents. So a lot of the times you'll see with the top two general mechanisms is maybe some low level resistance to erdopen or some resistance to erdopenem and maybe not your other cephalos, sorry, carbapenems. On this point in time, but your carbapenemases are going to be the one in particular that takes out all of your carbapenems without that additional beta lactam inhibitor. Um, so, getting back to these, um, the acronyms I mentioned earlier CRO versus CPRO. So, CRO is going to be your carbapenem resistant organisms. So, this is going to be due to an, any number of different mechanisms, but it's not going to be a carbapenemase. So, kind of like we were alluding to earlier, this is going to be the one that's probably most commonly seen is going to be Interbacter that's AMPC derepressed with a poron loss. Um, when you're looking at your MICs, you're going to notice some um, high level resistance to erdipenem. It's a one stage mutation that we know if you look into the literature, so greater than or equal to two. And you might have some low to mid level MICs to meropenem, so that one to two up to eight range. Um, it's going to hydrolyze erdipenem way more than when you see with meropenem and imipenem. And then your carbapenemase producing organisms. Um, that's going to be your enzymatic or carbapenemases. So this is where we're going to see your really high level meropenem resistance greater than equal to 16. Um, a few examples of these just to show you all. Um, this is a Klebsiella pneumoniae that you can see um, within this MIC right here range to of two to erdipenem, and then it's sensitive to meropenem. So we would still call this, you know. You know, we could still use meropenem in this case. Ideally, we want to use our maximum dosing, potentially that, that two grams Q8 extended infusion. So this is going to be, you know, just a carbapenem resistant organisms by classification. And then this is going to be another interobacter where you see um, down here on the right, they had e-tested it or asked, we asked, or sorry, they had retested it. So that's why it's kind of funky looking. But this is going to be your, um, you know, greater than or equal to 16 resistance to meropenem. And then when you look at your other available potential agents, um, this is your Ceftaz, Avibactam, or Avicas, um, you know, very sensitive. And then your Vabramir, very sensitive as well, because both of these have these two really nice uh, beta-lactam inhibitors. Um, so the five most common carbapenemases, um, class A was going to be your KPCs. It's going to be mostly in your Klebsiella, um, your E. coli, your interbacter, not particularly common in your non fermenter. So, Pseudomonas, Acinuta, um, really aren't going to be a KPC producer. Um, for your metallos, so that's your New Delhi, your Imp, and your Vim, 
it's going to be persistent throughout most groups. Um, it's they're you know increasing within the USA um, for a significant amount. Mostly your NDMAs is what's increasing. Um, your IMP and VIM is still you know across seas in Greece and um, in India more commonly there. Um, and the most ones that we're seeing organism wise with these are going to be E. coli. Um, Acinobacter and Pseudomonas, particularly Acinobacter is what I've noticed of later seen. And then our um, other group is going to be our OXA 48 like is mainly going to be only exclusive to um, your Enterobacter ACA. So again, your E. coli, um, Klebsiella, um, Enterobacter, those type. So getting into our carbapenemases, the main focus I had for this lecture is going to be on KPCs. So this came originally and was discovered in Klebsiella pneumoniae, carbapenemase. Um, it is mainly seen in Klebsiella E. coli, but you can, like I said, mention seen in other Enterobacteraceae. So why we choose uh, Vabermeer or Abicaz, which we'll get into some slides later that discuss the drugs, but both of them are able to inhibit carbapenemases, ESPLs, AMPCs, and they will still allow activity against organisms that, that produce these enzymes. The major thing to note with Abicaz, um, it has no anaerobic activity. You have to add mitroninazole for it. It still has limited to no gram positive activity. It's most optimal is going to be against your OXA 48 producing isolates. And then it possibly has better activity against non carbapenem producing organisms that are carbapenem resistant. <clears throat> so looking at Babermere, um, the biggest thing you can tell is that it's going to be stable against AMPC and ESBL hydrolysis. Uh, Babermirin itself is actually a boronic acid. Um, its inhibitory profile for it is going to be uh, class A KPC and class C that has a hyperproduction. Um, you'll notice that when you look at these MICs, this is for Enterobacter ACA, and then it has an NA right here for Pseudomonas, which we'll get a little bit into. Um, so for carbapenem producing Enterobacter ACA, so anything that has a poron mutation, um, enhanced efflux, uh, Vabermeer is able to inhibit those KBC and class A and C enzymes. Um, you are going to see some resistance with poron mutations and those metallobetalactamase production. Um, and then for Avicas or CZA, um, it's a combination of Ceftas and Abibactam. Um, as far as its inhibitory profile, um, class A, C, and D. So that it really is good if you have a high prevalence or you go somewhere where you know there's a high uh, rate of OXA48 resistance. Um, you'll notice it does have MICs for Enterobacteraceae and Pseudomonas. So it's able to uh, help with carbapenemase production, um, ESBLs, AMPCs expression with poron loss, and um, again, it gets MBL, uh, your metabobatalactamase, avibactam, doesn't inhibit MBLs, so this is going to be resistance. It doesn't restore that ceftaz. But for other beta lactamase and inhibition with ESBL and AMPC and KPC, you're going to have restored susceptibility. So breaking these down side by side, this is from an article from Pogue and um, CID in 2019. Um, it's labeled um, Avicaz versus Vabermeer or both. Um, so really getting into it, this is just a generic activity wise that we had discussed earlier. The two biggest concepts or two biggest places where Avicaz is going to be better is going to be looking at your OXA 48 like, um, your carbapenem resistant pseudomonas, and then potentially your pan resistant uh, pseudomonas as well with some limited activity. One thing to note, and you're going to see it happen right here, is that um, it does have been, it has been discovered, oops, sorry, it has been discovered that Avicaz has a low barrier to resistance with continual usage for KPCs. Um, there's a few articles out of Pittsburgh um, that look at high inoculum infections and a duration um, anywhere from 10 to 19 days. You can potentially see your patient on Avicaz actually um, end up you know, deteriorating because of it has a low barrier resistance versus Vabermeer. So this is why within his article, Pogue really does um, does really push to have both of these on formulary as Vabermeer tends to be a really strong workhorse for your KPCs and Avicaz can fit into your other areas. So as far as a prolonged usage of need of it, um, I would actually I downgraded its actual activity versus KPC with that low barrier to resistance. Um, this is going to briefly talk about the metallobetalactamases, um, which are listed here. It's that zinc based uh, cation for hydrolysis. It's capable of hydrolyzing all beta lactams except s -trinum. The issue is the majority of the time these organisms have other resistance mechanisms that actually inhibit S3M. Um, agents for use, um, most commonly 
probably seen Astrinum plus um, um, Abicaz. We're still waiting on the Astrinum Abibactam. I think it recently went through phase three. I haven't caught back up with the literature on it. But that for now, this is the combination that we're using without having the availability of Astrinum Abibactam. And then Cephadericol, as we know, has extremely gr potent gram-negative um, activity and doesn't have any um, embarrassed resistance besides actual some hyper -amp C production is what tends to be its downfall. Um, so to review kind of activity of your, for your wild type versus organism with KPC versus with OXO48 like, um, as you can see uh, here, your Abicaz, um, Abibactam is going to remain sensitive. Um, your Mirapinum Vaporbactam is going to remain sensitive as well within the presence of your KPC. Um, then when you hop over to OXO48 like, it's actually a really interesting organism. We had these um, a few in Michigan actually um, several times. It kind of throws you off because um, your third generation cephalosporins and ceftazidime and your fourth generation cephalosporin and cefepime actually tend to maintain some activity um, against these oxa 48 like um, and then some of the other oxa like carbapenemases actually you'll see sensitivity to ertapenem and mirapenem um, i still would strongly suggest if you do have you know uh, that test is running you do pop back out an oxidate resistance to not even I would not personally um, try to use any of these other agents, even if they do say maybe susceptible or, or susceptible dose dependent, because the enzymatic enzyme will likely just chew it away at a point in time. I would still, um, you know, go towards AB back, uh, Ceftas, AB back Tim, but you can see that Mirapinum vapor back Tim does not have really any activity against Oxy 48 like. And then for your uh, New Delhi um, metallobetalactamases, um, everything is going to be pretty much across the board um, resistance um, resistant. You will see a little bit of some isolate sensitive with s m if it doesn't have, you know, an ESBL with it or any kind of other mutation. Um, so that'll transition over to what kind of your um, thought process should be if you do have this carbapenemase presented. Um, you can tell, uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, amipenem real back to later on, uh, but not particularly used a whole lot as far as, I mean, it is available, but you tend to either use Vapormir or Avicast for, to go along with it. Um, so to add in, to complete the chart, um, I added in, you know, your s maybe maybe back to MSF Jericho. They're going to maintain susceptibility no matter what the actual um, me mechanism of resistance is. Um, there are some studies that have come out of late about Cephadericol with um, limited to no exposure and actual resistance in Pseudomonas. A lot of that's driven by like a super um, production of AMP-C beta-lactamases, but traditionally your normal um, AMP-C beta-lactamase does not inhibit it. Um, and then for Astrinum, maybe back to it kind of falls some variable susceptibilities to your OXA-48 like carbapenemases, but its main place as therapy is going to be for these NDMAs, or ND NDM, sorry. So now to transition to our final one, which I think is everybody's probably most difficult thing to focus on, I mean, particularly from like even a you know, the pharmacy wise, trying to optimize your PKPD, just because Pseudomonas has so many different kinds of mechanism of resistance. Um, so it has multiple mechanisms, uh, mechanisms of intrinsic resistance, which just make it the organism that it is that we all, you know, tend to fear when we see it, you know, pop up on a culture. Um, so poron loss or poron channel loss um, is going to have your alterations, your uh, membrane permeability. Its biggest one is going to be operon D. It's going to confer that low level resistance to carbapenems. Um, efflux pumps. Uh, these are going to actually have different affinities for various beta lactams. Um, it'll upregulate its R and D efflux pump um, all the all the virtual time, but it's interesting in that each individual pump that it has actually targets different beta lactams based upon exposure. Um, the most kind of common one we see is MEX A and B and Operon M. Um, it'll affect multiple beta lactams and fluoroquinolones. Um, it's detected in wild type cells, so it traditionally has this actual <clears throat> regulation. Um, another one is MEX CD and Operon J. It mainly affects your fourth generation cephalosporin. It's not detected in wild type cells, but it will develop this with continual exposure to cefepime. Um, its other mechanism of re intrinsic resistance is AMPC overproduction, um, that it can acquire um, extended beta lactamases. Um, it tends to be more common in other countries where it does this, but the main point about the multiple mechanisms of intrinsic resistance 
is that it has specific ability to inhibit different metal actins based upon exposure. So you can have a ceftri or sorry, cefepime resistant pseudomonas that's sensitive to zosin or sensitive to meropenem, or you can actually have, um, which we'll discuss a little bit about next time, an actual meropenem resistant pseudomonas that's sensitive to cefepime and zosin. Because of these multiple intrinsic resistance that are just specific to a poron loss or efflux pump, you can still use your other beta lactams sensitivity wise and don't have to worry about enzymatic breakdown of them. So one thing that it does, um, which you can look about in the literature of, there's two good articles. Um, so if you saw back over here, um, this right here, this Operon AB, or sorry, MEX AB and Operon M, um, that's multiple beta lactams and fluoroquinolones. That is actually how um, it, it selects for meropenem non-susceptible pseudomonases. So they've kind of gone away from carbapenem resistant pseudomonases because when you think of carbapenem resistance, you think of pan resistance to your beta lactams versus just a selective actual inhibition of one antibiotic. So because of four um, uh, mechanism to enhance the frequency of mutations, it causes this bacterial drug resistance and it inhibits or enhances the carbapenem resistant mutation rate in pseudomonas via that operon AB or operon M or actual loss of uh, poron D activity when looking back at these studies. So would not be um, surprised if you are already have or if you haven't uh, come across a pseudomonas that is just strict, strictly meropenem resistant and sensitive to all other beta lactams, maybe because of previous, you know, poor clonalone exposure. Um, as far as our difficult to treat pseudomonas drugs um, have lifted here, um, Zerbaxa is going to be your main workhorse that we'll discuss. Um, Abicaz, which is ceftazidine and amibactam, uh, Recarbro, amipenem relbactam. Uh, Cefidericol is listed here, but I'm not going to discuss it. And then um, I have polymixin and colicin listed here because both come across pain resistance, but please don't ever use them. Like it has to be your last, last resort. I strongly encourage utilizing these other agents before going to one of them. I think we all know about the toxicities. We don't even know if there's an actual MIC for pseudomonas to polymixin. We kind of just have a, a number now that comes out. So it's really difficult to really ascertain of how well these, um, or how well polymixin and colicin work against some of these organisms. Um, so ceftolazine tazobactam is a novel cephalosporin with increased potency for pseudomonas because of a modified side chain. Um, it tends to bind its PVPs better. Um, it has a higher affinity for those PVPs, um, decreased efflu um, efflux by pseudom uh, pseudomonas, and then it has some more stability towards your um, ESBLs and some of your AMPCs. So it's really, if you want to think about it, it's really ceftazidine down here. The models, the, uh, the models kind of flipped. With this side chain added on right here. So if you do have a patient that does have a hypersensitivity reaction to ceftazidine, I would be worried about using ceftol, uh, ceftoltezo uh, purely because of uh, that mechanistic. If they have a you know allergy to cefepime, I still would use ceftoltezo because of the kind of differences within that. But um, ceftazidine would be kind of a you know a potential you know hindrance on my end um, to want to use um, Cervaxa. Um, it does have two doses that are approved, uh, 1.5 Q8 over one hour, and then three grams over one hour, which is for HAP and VAP. I strongly encourage using the three grams Q8 all the time, unless you have maybe a complicated UTI or maybe a very light skin, um, skin and soft tissue infection that you have. Uh, the reason for this, which you might remember from my PKPD lecture, um, when you break down some of the studies with Zervaxa, and the patients that had renal dysfunction with renal adjustments of Zervaxa, they actually had worse outcomes. So really, you know, preemptively dose reducing, um, you know, evaluating the, the the harm and benefit factor there. Really considering that, you know, if I have a very sick patient, I'm always in, going to encourage the higher dosing, at least up front. You know, maybe once they get more stable or maybe when you fully know they have source control of that complicated intra-abdominal infection, you feel comfortable going down to that. But if I'm using this as my, you know, I have pain resistant pseudomonas, or sorry, a beta lactam resistant pseudomonas and meropenem resistant pseudomonas, I'm probably going to encourage or at least recommend using that through gram Q8 um, up front, no matter what maybe the infection is. Um, Abicast that we kind of briefly discussed earlier, um, still kind of the same journalized concept. Um, these are its MICs based on the bottom of it, less than equal to eight over four. Um, ME rail back to him or recarbro, um, we've tried to use it here at Moffitt one or two times, but it tends to be the more expensive of the three, and it's kind of in an odd place. 
um, in the category of where it actually fits in. So it does um, have activity against amipenem resistant pseudomonas. Um, so a place that has heavy amipenem uses, this might be one of your agents that you add onto formulary. Um, and it can overcome some um, efflux and poron mutations and some AMPC mutations. So here we're going to have some cases to kind of see, you know, what you would want to do just because I think there's a lot of different answers that could be right or could not be right. So CB is a 71 year old man with a history of cholangial carcinoma complicated by cholangitis after hepatic duct sending in placement of a bilary drain catheter, your typical patient at Moffitt. Um, he smokes one pack a day, has an allergy to Cipro, came into the ED with a fever um, up to 102, chills, uh, leukocytosis of 23. Um, the admitting team is concerned for a biliary tract infection. He was initiated on Zosin after blood cultures and drain cultures were obtained. Um, he continues to have a low-grade fever. Um, his white count has not dropped below 16. Um, on day four, his biliary culture was finalized following susceptibility patterns. Uh, what would you, um, from your standpoint, what drugs would you want to add on, or would you want to add on any drugs, or would you want to continue with the same regimen? So you could try meripenem. Would you want to, with this initial susceptibility report, add anything on or just go strictly to meripenem? I will tell you the meripenem MIC of two is at the break point. And then I would uh, test for symptoms on uh, the back down as well. Yeah, so that's what we um, did at this time. We tested for um, septal tazobactam and ceftazidine, maybe bactam, uh, both so really good. Um, sensitivity. So this kind of falls into the case of, you know, if this patient was potentially improving and we got these sensitivity results back, you know, I continue on with Zosin. Um, it is near its break point, um, but it really goes about, you know, going back to how that patient's doing. Um, at this point in time, once we were preemptively, we actually got these sensitivities back um, and then preemptively just switched over to Zerbaxa, even though um, it piperacillin piper back to him, said it was sensitive um, at 16. Um, it, it's you still could optimize, you know, considering the patient, you know, go to four and a half grams uh, Q6 over four hours to see if, you know, can get that target attainment. Ideally, maybe go to that in the beginning. Um, but it is something that is difficult um, that some people would debate back and forth uh, that if you see these susceptibilities up front, just go ahead and strictly switching over to um, Zerbaxa without even trying to use Zosin at this point in time. Why would it, so Meripenem at two, you would not use that? Um, if I have the availability to use um, Zerbaxa, just knowing its outcomes and knowing how this patient, I mean, considering he had a low-grade fever and maybe not drunk, you go to meropenem at this point in time, you just switch it in full, you know, go to two grams Q8, extended infusion and see how they do, considering he's like relatively stable, but he's not super sick. But if he were to maybe have, you know, another high-grade fever or his white count shoot back up, you know, extreme abdominal pain, um, you know, things that fall in line with that, that would be the, you know, maybe the more call to go towards your backs at that point. But you do have to real, uh, remember with your breakpoints that come out, um, and this will be at every institution, you kind of have a, a plus minus one dilution up and down. So that meropenem MIC could be four, or it could be two, or it could be one. Um, same, you know, goes for the other ones. Um, looking at this, some people will say to you, you could potentially use, you know, cystazidime in this standpoint. I kind of coincide ceftazidime and cefepime in my C's together. Um, I know some people would see this and say it's susceptible, but I would probably just go with it's resistant if cefepime's already up at 16 as well. Um, it's something to consider. Uh, what the, the, I assume pretty sensitive, they have enemies as a lab does not detect. If you have that kind of borderline to meropen, there's probably a secondary mechanism, something like box or something. Yeah, like this is. Could you overwhelm that with a higher dose of meropen? Is that if you were going to meropen on this guy, is this a guy that you could high dose over a long time? Yeah, I would do the two grams Q8 extended infusion. So with those, that's the nice thing or interesting thing about with the poron. Um, and uh, efflux mutations, it's, you know, it's just eliminating how much drug stays within this, with, within the bacteria. So if you just completely overwhelm it, it can't continually pump that out. Now, maybe continue exposure, you know, for two weeks, it might, you know, develop a mechanism at that point in time. 
But for something in this state where maybe, you know, you do have a drain in there and it looks like he might just need, you know, a more active drug um, at this point in time. I didn't actually put the dose of Zosin he was on that maybe would have better helped y'all for that. But something to kind of consider, you know, going back and forth of there is potentially multiple answers, but, you know, within this they could be. Oh, yeah. Let's say we're at a, a hospital or a community hospital. Someone doesn't have access to these uh, drugs. Um, would you ever consider doing just like a amino glycoside? Um, I if I had did not have access to Zerbaxa in this patient, I would have put them on um, tobramycin and mirapidum together. And just to, at that point, or just you know, you go with your high dose mirapidum if you don't have access, you know, to those other potential agents. Um, you know, just considering that if you lose your mirapidum at this point in time, you're kind of left with, you know, nothing essentially at that point. So, yeah, consideration for adding on mirapidum plus tobramycin is something as well um, that can be considered. Is there any discomfort there? Um, some people will argue that. So, a lot of the um, aminoglycoside modifying enzymes are um, aminoglycoside specific. Um, typically, once you lose amicacin, you kind of your other aminoglycosides, um, especially greater than 100, 128. In this case, this I don't know whether this patient had previous exposure to amicacin or, or what that actual ordeal was. Is you generalized generalized thinking that your amicacin is your more stable um, aminoglycoside to these resistance mechanisms. So I at this point in time would you know have to go forth with it with the information I know based upon this. But it is something to you know consider with those other two at that point. Do you ever use like a like um, for cystitis, yes. For anything else, no. Um, when you go back and look through the literature, so for HAPVAP, um, even the guidelines recommend not using it because of potential. I mean, the thing about it's PKPD, it's really good at getting in the blood and getting renally eliminated. Um, so that's why, you know, for sepsis, there tends to be that, you know, additional times one agent that's given to maybe help, you know, with synergy for that aspect. Do I know of anything like if I had a a pilo or something that, you know, with secondary, you know, bloodstream infection, could I trust an aminoglycoside? I don't recommend, or I don't know of any studies that have actually looked at that. It probably would work to be just how well it concentrates in the blood plus the urine and that stem point. Um, but just in general by itself, it tends to be not recommended. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Green. Um, so if you have three choices, such as Cefiteracol, Avacaz, and Zerbaxa, theoretically all three, based on these numbers, would work fine, but um, some of them may be much more expensive, and therefore we wouldn't use Cefiteracol because it's twice as expensive as the others. Do you have a preference between the three, and why would you pick one over the other? So you picked Zerbaxa, so why didn't you pick Cefiteracol and Abacaz? Um, with Zerbaxa, when you really look at the literature, it's been studied in four studies now against a multidrug resistant pseudomonas. It just has the better outcomes activity. Um, at Ceftaz, Abibactam has one study out there. Um, I think it's a HAP study that had recently come out that shows, you know, comparable comparable data to the other ones, but I still would just, the act, knowing the activity and the stability of the other, you know, larger groups of studies with, you know, Trump with Zerbaxa. And then <clears throat> Sofitricol has some, has some data that we know that we know of just, you know, against best available therapy for some of these multidrug resistant organisms, but I would try to reserve it if I had breakthrough with my Zerbaxa would be kind of my argument would be to hold off on it until we have resistance developed to our other agents. That's awesome answer, and you're an expert, and I would rely on your opinion. It's just like knowing all the HIV mutations, which I have no clue on, that you keep up with the literature so you can make the best choice. So thank you for that great answer. No problem. Yeah, two more cases. Um, just another one that makes you a little bit think on it. So KL is a 59-year-old woman, history of diabetes, hypertension, uh, chronic kidney disease, so about a year and a half ago, she had a right hip arthroplasty that was complicated with the pseudomonas infection after the initial surgery, but she got six weeks of cefepime. About six months ago, she fell, underwent a revision. Um, since that, that surgery, she states her incision has fully healed, but she has this slimy green pleurulent discharge. Um, she presented the hospital with fevers up to 103, um, night sweats, chills, and redness tracking from her hip. Um, a CT scan shows the infection has invaded deeper tissue. 
Um, orthopedics takes her to the operating room for another hip revision and resection of the femur because of intraoperative findings of pus in the bone. So these would be your initial um, susceptibilities that come back. Um, would you want to add anything on or would you feel comfortable utilizing one of these agents up here, knowing that you're probably going to give her with another re revision, you know, anywhere up to 12 weeks at this point in time? Yeah, I would again get susceptibilities for time time. Yep. yep. So this is another prime example too to point out before we get to an answer. So you see meropenem resistance of eight. You can see that adding um, that meropenem vapor back to adds no utility adding that on. Um, this was just um, an easy example that I was able to find, you know, that shows that that vapor back to really is specifically for KPC enzymes and doesn't help out with any of those other poron or efflux mutations that is um, back to AV back to and just in general that stuff tolzine is able to stay sensitive against. But yes, knowing that I'm going to be treating her for an extended blown period of time, I probably would go with Zerbaxa again, um, pending what orthopedic says when they go back there, you know, how much bone they cut away, how, you know, what we're able to talk with the surgeons of. I could see giving, you know, adding the four, four and a half, you know, Q6 of um, Zosin at this point in time. So giving her, I guess, essentially 18 and a half grams, you know, over 24 hours for this period to see how she tolerates that but still would have a little bit of worrisome just needing to know what the surgeons, you know, got at that point in time. Did they get clean margins? Um, did, how far up did they were able to go? Is there still some of that deeper tissue that wasn't do able to be deprived? Because at that point in time, already with previous exposure, um, might, you know, have some elevated um, MICs that come about. And then one more case, um, don't worry about the little blue box, I just hit it because it has a number. So KS is a 65-year-old woman with a history of uterine cancer after a total, total abdomen hysterectomy in 2011 with recurrence in 16, which she received radiation. She presents the ED of nausea, vomiting, and left flank pain. Um, urine cultures are obtained, which turn positive for pseudomonas. Um, these are the susceptibility patterns that come about. So again, same kind of question, would you want to get on any additional add-on susceptibilities? or just be able to uh, comfortably treat with this profile. So it was at the point in time, the person that was doing this did feel the same way. They did want to get, you know, the add-ons or Baxa and Avicas. Um, again, this is just an example too, that shows, you know, your mirror pin resistance at 16, um, and then adding on the vapor back to him, you're still going to have a resistance. Um, but something to kind of contemplate um, is the location of this infection. So this is a, you know, urinary tract infection um, is some, uh, we don't have, you know, blood cultures aren't listed on here, but let's say they're negative. So let's just say it's, you know, it's considered a pilo. You know, knowing that our um, antibiotics, you know, are able to concentrate extremely well there, this might be, you know, a patient that you do the one gram Q6 extended infusion of cefepime and I'd have to utilize your other agents just because of how well it concentrates in there. We know that it's not a high inoculum infection. Um, it's something that, you know, especially consideration, especially if she was started on, you know, cefepime or started on Zosin prior to getting this additional information um, that was going on. But, you know, can be something of debate when you get that back. I mean, I know people would want to get that information back and see that, you know, high activity of the Zerbaxa. And, you know, if your patient's doing fine, I would encourage, you know, continuing on and dose optimizing um, maybe your cefepime or Zosin that you have at this time, just realizing the location of the infection, you know, what's going on versus maybe just preemptively jumping to um, Zerbaxa at this point. Also, um, yeah, I, in this case, I think, you know, utilizing Ceftaz or Ceftepime, like they were started on, you know, Ceftaz at this point, you know, Qgrams Q8, and I get them, I get these culture results back of the additional add-ons doing completely fine i'm going to continue i would encourage continuing on with that making the argument that yes it is higher level mic's but we have a you know location of an infection where our drug is you know gets it gets friendly adjusted so it's back it's getting poured on into the urinary tract system at that point in time but really going back to you know right of how my patient how's my patient doing are they still fevering they still have you know any kind of flank pain like what's going on with them clinically wise what do you think about a single dose aminoglycoside scenario if this was a cystitis, I would actually encourage that. It's, a, it's I think aminoglycosides are really underutilized um, for just the location of infection. There's more data coming out with pilo with them, um, but we used to um, have a, a, a state of uh, you know a cystitis, no matter what it was, just giving a one-time aminoglycoside, and you know it's able to have 
bacterial activity for eight to 16 hours after it's already clearanced out would be a perfect something in this. So some people may feel comfortable with one time dose. You may want to give, end up giving two with it, um, separate it apart, but I think that's a completely reasonable option. And like this way, like higher, higher intensities. But let's say exactly as you said, you did one of these agents where normally you'd be a little reticent and are clinically improving. Is there anything in addition? I mean, you might say stick with that agent, but is there anything in addition that you would say as far as change in duration or change in the dosage you're giving them? Is that kind of also site dependent? Yeah, so the question was um, if you, you know, have this scenario where you've, you know, you pick cefepime and these MICs come back, would you want to extend your duration or would you want to change the dose or would you want to make any additional modification maybe to your regimen? Um, so if this, you know, Bittenville came back and they were on, let's say, ceftaz and it was one gram Q8, I would preferably change it to two. Um, considering this is pilo with the left flank pain. If it's cystitis, I kind of have to think in my head, I lower lower area, drugs in there really, really well. What I, could I still consider changing to max dosing? I would, you know, that's definitely a consideration, but, you know, really maximizing your, um, you know, the amount of drug you can give up front, um, obviously will, you know, overcome or get to those MICs that we know of within that category.